Ready? Okay, so hello everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Nick Hill Dutt from UC Irvine for today's uh, uh, lecture as part of the GEOS Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. Uh, professor Dutt is a distinguished professor of computer science, uh, cognitive sciences, uh, and electrical engineering computer science at the University of California at Irvine, as I mentioned. Uh, he also is a distinguished visiting professor of uh, computer science and engineering at the um, Indian Institute, Institute of Technology in uh, Bombay, India. Uh, Nick holds a PhD uh, from the uh, University of Illinois at <coughs> Urbana Champaign. Um, and his research interests are in embedded systems, electronic design automation, computer architecture and compilers, distributed systems, healthcare, IoT, and uh, brain inspired architectures and computing. Uh, he holds numerous awards, uh, best paper awards, uh, and many more. Uh, he has co authored uh, uh, seven books, uh, has served as editor in chief in uh, um, quite a few distinguished journals, and of course, uh, he is an ACM and an ITBOLI fellow uh, and the recipient of the IFIP Silver Core Award. Uh, Nick will talk about self aware memory management for emerging energy efficient architectures today. And without further ado, Nick. Thank you, Theo, for the very warm, warm welcome. And uh, thank you all for inviting me uh, to give a talk. It's my first visit to Cyprus. We're really enjoying our time here. Uh, wonderful people, um, very nice uh, climate. Um, it so happens that uh, Theo and I are related. Uh, we happen to be uh, second cousins of sorts because I got my master's from uh, Penn State and my advisor was also co-advising Theo. So we happen to have some history together. Um, today's talk uh, has an um, interesting sounding title. Uh, this word self-awareness appears a lot in many different contexts, uh, not just in engineering, but in psychology and in many other areas. So what I'd like to do is share with you some of the uh, broad themes and projects that we're doing in this space, particularly it related to how we can deploy these strategies for making memory uh, systems uh, more adaptive and resilient. So that's the context for the talk. Uh, we will be covering quite a lot. And I, I, you know, I asked Theo how long the talk should be. He said maybe one hour. And uh, he didn't give a hard limit, so that could be a problem. With academics, if you don't give a hard limit, then it could be a problem. But having said that, there, there are too many slides. So what I plan to do is to give you an overview of what we mean by computational self-awareness. We'll start with that idea. It may be familiar to many people, especially in Theo's group, since uh, we work on topics similar to that. Having set that context, I'll talk broadly about some of the challenges we face in designing memory subsystems, not only for emerging computer architectures, but in the context of newer applications, we're seeing uh, you know, a, a sort of a whole new set of new applications that are emerging. And each of these um, domains, if you will, present very interesting memory um, problems. And uh, they require adaptivity. Oftentimes, these systems have to deal with changes in the environment, changes in the context, changes in the um, service quality, and uh, we have to make these uh, design these systems so they can adapt very quickly. So that's the context. And much of the work today is based on uh, the dissertation of uh, my uh, PhD student, uh, Deep Bishwadeep Deep Maitri. So uh, this will be part of his, his dissertation. So I'll focus on that. So having um, discussed that, I'm not sure how I can move forward, but. It's frozen, perhaps. Sorry. Ah, oh, there. Okay, so um, you know, just a little bit um, to set the context, right? Uh, when we design uh, computer systems today, we're actually doing this across multiple levels of abstraction, and we can view these systems all the way from low-level devices that you see here, in terms of the types of technology we use, to the architectures we deploy. Uh, to the software systems that run on these architectures and all the way to how we design applications. And it's very important that we think about how we design these systems in a holistic manner. This requires us to think in a cross-layer manner. 
and requires us to think holistically about how we can look at these design issues across the stack. So having said that, you know, uh, in spite of the advances we see in computing and platforms, we see that memory continues to be a challenge in terms of how we can deliver data to the right place at the right time, regardless of the application, and it becomes even worse. So in the context of energy efficiency in particular, memory subsystems oftentimes are the hogs, they're the energy hogs, and so we have to think about how we can design those in an energy efficient manner. So on one hand, uh, you know, we have a lot of challenges, as in, you know, how can we uh, manage these memory resources at runtime for these different types of architectures. But what I want to present today is the opportunity that we can use in exploiting what we call as computational self-awareness principles. And secondly, how we can also exploit approximations as another mechanism, as a lever for us to be able to design these systems more adaptively. So that's the context. I have a, a large roadmap for the talk today. And as I mentioned, uh, I just plan to cover some highlights. So what I'd like to do first is uh, talk a little bit about the role of computational self-awareness, what it means. And having set the context for that, I'll give you some insights on how we have used those strategies at multiple levels of abstraction. So the insights that I present will be um, you know, from the architecture level at the systems level, as well as the application layer. We have a lot of ground to cover. I'll be sharing the slides with you as well as references. So uh, you, you'll excuse me if I don't get into a lot of details because I do want to give you some insight in terms of what some of the challenges are and how we can use computational awareness to achieve adaptivity. So uh, what do we mean by self-awareness in computing systems? There's a growing community of researchers who are trying to take biologically inspired principles of self-awareness and apply that to build adaptive systems. And so we can look at it from the perspective of how we can build systems where the, the systems can actually learn models where we capture knowledge about themselves and the environment in an ongoing basis. So you may design a system, but when you deploy the system in the field, you want it to start learning and enhancing the models that they have. So there's that one idea. And the second key idea is that once we have those models, can we reason about these models and enable to, them to act with the goals in an adaptive manner? So these are two key ideas that we'd like to deploy. And having said that, I think it's important to note that computational self-awareness is not AI, it's not neuromorphic computing, and it's not neuroscience. But instead, what it is, is it's trying to understand how we can apply these for adaptive autonomy to make intelligent runtime decisions. And the second is how we can have the ability to reason about and manage this autonomy during runtime. So it's inspired by adaptivity that we see in biological systems. Can we actually build, in some sense, a poor man's model that we can deploy in engineers in an engineering sense to make these systems more adaptive. So that's, that's the key idea. So let's go back to this uh, picture that we saw earlier. And this is a, a picture of um, an abstraction stack, a cartoon, if you will. And what you see in this cartoon is uh, multiple levels of abstraction from the lowest level of, uh, say, devices all the way to applications. And if you look at this, these abstraction levels, what we have is the ability to actually sense information at each of these abstraction levels. And using something like a control loop, be able to um, decide on what actions to make based on the context of your constraints. And so this is a standard control loop that you have, and you might view this as a system where you actually um, do things where you actually sense, where you're observing, and then you make a decision, and then you act. So a very straightforward control loop that you see, and what's interesting here is that you're fusing information from multiple abstraction levels. And so you're able to get, get information from the lowest level of abstraction all the way to the highest level and fuse that in a manner where you can then go back and react and change the system state based on the constraints. So I think this is very well known to all of us in, in standard control systems. So we, we'll call this a reactive system. The changes in the system, you react 
and uh, you might change as you move along. So uh, in, in contrast, what we want to do is also have another maybe slower loop, which is a reflective loop. Reflection is something that we see in, in most living organisms. We know that in humans, for example, we have these two systems of thought. We have the autonomic nervous system where we don't think, but we can react very quickly. You touch something hot, you'll jump back without thinking. And you have the reflective system, which allows us to do planning. So just before the talk, I was getting thirsty. So you know, I was trying to decide, should I go up and get some water or should I ask Theo to get me a bottle of water? So that was a reflection to, for me to try and decide in terms of alternate strategies to make the decision that I want. And these two systems in most biological um, organisms work in tandem. And you might argue that uh, there's even some transfer of knowledge from a reflective system to a reactive system. So a tennis player who uh, practices a lot, a lot of the actions that the player does professionally becomes part of the intuition. Whereas a novice player like me, I have to think a lot when I play tennis. So these two systems are, are very, very ingrained in biology. We want to use those ideas in building our engineered systems to be able to react and plan ahead. So computational self-awareness is this idea that we have the loop of observe, reflect, decide, and act. And so I think the reflection is a key part that uh, we think would actually endow systems to be more adaptive. So that's kind of a very quick overview of what we uh, think of in terms of uh, reflection. But reflection comes at a cost. It takes time, it takes resources. You have to build models on which you can react and, and, and make changes. And so this cartoon here shows you a time scale where um, if you look um, in, in this axis here, uh, to the right is finer green time scales and to the left is coarser green time scales. So if you look in computer systems, how do we actually make decisions um, if you take a computer architecture, you're making scheduling decisions at very fine grains of time. And so you could see that the decisions that we make in terms of should I preempt a task is something that's done at the level of perhaps a microsecond. Some decisions in computer systems like uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling are perhaps done at a higher level of time, time granularity. So you might actually decide in terms of deciding what the next frequency should be, which might be in the order of milliseconds. And then you can go coarser grain if you're doing something like task mapping or task switching that might be done at the operating system level interval. And so you might be doing this in terms of hundreds to maybe thousands of milliseconds. And you can keep going on this axis if you're doing something like uh, try to look at wear out or aging of systems, that's going to be even on the order of years. So the point I'm making is that because these decisions have to be made at different time scales, the reflective loops have to be able to support that. And you might not be able to support it if it's too fast, or you might need to have very quick, very lightweight techniques that allow you to support that. So the point is that reflection is a good idea, but you have to use it with care and understand how and when to apply them and how you actually deploy them. And we'll see some examples in, in the rest of the talk that, that I'll, I'll describe in terms of how we apply them, deploy them for memory subsystems. So just as an example, uh, we um, built a middleware called Mars, which is a middleware, middleware for adaptive reflective computer systems. And I'll give you the insight in terms of how we can use this to actually do things like uh, task mapping, uh, adaptive resource allocation, et cetera, in computer systems. So um, let's go back and look at uh, what the context is here. So we are continually trying to make decisions during runtime for these computing systems. An example might be um, if uh, there's a change in the workload, uh, the task mapping policy may want to ask the question, should I actually uh, change my allocation of tasks from a smaller lightweight resource to a heavier resource? Now, this kind of decision can be ingrained into an algorithm and determined statically, but what we might want to do is adaptively decide based on the context of execution when it makes sense. So in that case, what we want to do is actually ask the question to say, what if I did a certain change 
and then get an answer back in terms of an estimation of what the result is. And based on that, make a decision by looking at multiple alternatives. So this requires us to have a reflective system model of the entire system that we can then use and execute on the fly to be able to evaluate alternatives. So in the context of that, we built this um, Mars middleware. And again, um, this is just an example of how we can do that. You see again, the system stack here where you have a um, heterogeneous, maybe uh, multi-processor platform at the bottom. You have the operating system stack and you have an application. On the right-hand side, you see sensors that can sense information at multiple levels of abstraction and actuators here that can actuate at multiple levels. So here, for example, in terms of scheduling, scheduling, we might decide in terms of what resources to allocate. Uh, we might do things like dynamically voltage frequency scaling or change the types of applications we run. So what you can see here in this uh, diagram is you could have a simple control loop which is your standard reactive loop, where we could sense the information from each of these levels, fuse that together, and then use different policies to actuate decisions that we make. In terms of uh, trying to build some amount of computational self-awareness, what we need to do is we'd have to create on the side models of each of these levels of abstraction. So we'd have to create models of the application, models of the software, models of the hardware, and on these models, we can then ask these reflective questions in terms of decision-making, which can then be passed on to actually effect a particular policy. So you can see that here we have these two loops where we could have the reactive loop that you see here and the reflective loop, which is running at a slower time scale here. And this environment that we've built allows us to use um, experimental platform where you could actually try different policies and apply them. And we've used this uh, quite effectively in many of the uh, memory management resource policies that you see in, in the rest of the stuff. So um, we uh, hopefully got some sense of what we mean by computational self-awareness and how it might be applied in a computing context. For the next half of my talk, I want to talk about how we can apply that for doing memory management. So uh, let's, let's try and uh, get a sense of what the state of the art is in memory management. And we can look at this again at multiple levels of abstraction. I apologize if the uh, figures are very small to see, but you'll get a sense of what we're talking about. And you can look at the slides later. But uh, if you look at the very highest level of abstraction at the system level, the abstraction of memory is really about data structures. And we can apply different types of approximation techniques and memory management policies. There's been tons of work done where people have looked at using different types of um, um, you know, uh, application level um, approximations as well as policies. In a similar manner, we can go down at the operating system level. We can look at the abstraction of memory as heaps, stacks, file systems, and memory pages. And again, we can do different types of approximation here, as well as uh, memory management policies. Going down the abstraction level, we can look at the architectural level. And here we're looking at um, abstractions such as buffers, registers, caches, scratch pad memories, high bandwidth memory. And then we can apply different approximation techniques as well as memory management. Going down further, you can do this again at the circuit or device level where for memories, you're looking at the abstractions of memory cells, transistors, et cetera, and you can apply different approximation as well as memory management policies. So the fact of the matter is there's been a large body of work done across all of these. But in trying to apply this in the context of adaptivity, we find there are several shortcomings. So if you look from the perspective of approximations, uh, one challenge is that this requires manual tuning of parameters at each of these levels. This is a challenge because an application designer may not know what uh, technology is being used. Conversely, a technologist may not really appreciate the software abstraction at the highest level. So it becomes very challenging to have a tall, thin designer who can go across the abstraction stack. And consequently, much of the work we've seen in the past has been limited to one or a few adjacent levels of hierarchy where they might do some approximations. In a similar manner, if you look in terms of 
uh, sample and memory management policies. Um, our study showed that typically application developers, as you mentioned, may not have an appreciation of detailed hardware characteristics. And because the platforms are changing so rapidly, the architectures are changing, the technology is changing, it becomes very difficult to support workload specific um, optimizations. So these pose huge challenges in how we can move forward. And uh, we posit that by using self-awareness principles, we can actually address these issues. So on one hand, uh, we discussed the challenges with approximation techniques and these emerging architectures. On the other hand, if you look in the context now of new application context, there are very new scenarios that traditionally computer systems designers and researchers have not been addressing. The first is the idea of end-to-end uh, -end application context, right? So, um, you know, I, I understand the PO Center, you have a lot of work in autonomy, autonomous systems. So if you look at these systems, you have sensors that are fusing different types of data coming in at different rates and actuating actuators at different rates. And there are end-to-end -end deadlines that must be satisfied either for the reasons of safety or for performance. So how do you actually manage this ensemble of different end-to-end -end pipelines on a computational platform is a huge new challenge that we think is uh, challenging. And that has a big ramification in terms of memory subsystem. The second is this notion of systems at scale. And this is in the context of looking at things like data centers. If you look at how we can build large scale software systems that execute on very large distributed platforms, the challenges of doing this kind of optimization at scale become very, very interesting and challenging. And these pose new and interesting challenges for memory subsystems. So I think the idea there is uh, to find mechanisms where we can use computational self-awareness to automate these workload and architecture-specific optimizations. So that's where we think there's going to be big leverage in applying these techniques. So um, coming back to that picture we saw earlier, you can see here the abstraction stack for the computer system, uh, different types of sensors, different types of actuators, and this loop that we have, which is trying to do an observe um, reflect, decide, and act loop that you see here with the two loops. You have the uh, fast control loop and you have the slower reflective control loop in tandem. And what we want to be able to do is uh, with the goal, depending on the context, with the goal of maybe prior to meeting, trying to meet application POS or minimizing energy, we want to take the sets data of the memory across the stack and then apply reasoning to see if you're meeting the current constraints, and if not, have adaptive techniques to act, right? So this is the context for how we do that. So we've, uh, together with Deep and other members in the lab, we've tried to do this at multiple abstraction levels. And I'll share with you some of the key ideas at each of these levels to give you a sense of how we can apply computational self-awareness. So we have, for example, a work we've done at the architectural level, uh, which says uh, how we can look at self-adaptive memory approximation and uh, policies for doing this in an adaptive manner. We've done um, a bunch of work at the system level in how we might deploy these type of policies for heterogeneous platforms, as well as for systems at scale in data centers. And then at the application level, we have a bunch of work where we're trying to see how we can apply these for end-to-end real-time pipelines. So uh, we'll sort of do a quick walkthrough over this entire space of uh, app, you know, both applications and systems as well as at the architecture level. So I'll stop here for a minute and see if there are any questions. If not, I'll, I'll keep going. <clears throat> so feel free to stop me if there are questions at any time. Right. So let's take a, a quick look at uh, what we can do for adaptive memory uh, optimization at the architecture level. And towards that end, I'll, I'll give you some insights on two specific pieces of work we've done in this context. The first is looking at uh, self-adaptive memory approximation using a formal control theoretic approach. And the second is trying to apply self-optimizing runtime manager for approximate memory systems. 
So, um, so the challenge is this. Um, what we want to be able to do is, uh, so let me pop this stat for a minute. We understand that for a large class of applications, uh, memory approximations are very effective. So uh, I know that there's work in Kiosk in looking at uh, vision and sensing. And these type of applications, we, we understand that you can play with the quality by appro using approximations or not. So the, that gives you a huge opportunity in terms of how you can save energy. The question is, how can you do that effectively and change it adaptively in front of And in the past, there's been work in what we would call as a binary approximation knobs, where something is on or off. But also, we uh, did some work in trying to take this and have a finer grain of approximation using multi level approximation. So, I'll give you some insight on how that works. And then, um, you know, there are references to paper, papers that I have in the presentation, and you can take a look at those later. So uh, what do we mean by a binary approximation knob? This is the idea of having the quality configurability as a knob where you can change the degree of approximation by either turning it on or off. And uh, so the idea here is to, do, to be able to take um, the application, let's go back for a minute, I think I jumped ahead, uh, where we can take the application that you have and you can actually embed within the application hints to say which parts of the application are proximal and which parts are not. And given that the system may be able to apply at runtime strategies for deciding what level of approximation to apply to meet the quality constraints and the goals that we have. So that's the idea here where you may be given a target uh, output quality as a metric that you have. And then we have an intelligent cross layer controller that takes the sense of information and decides how to change these knobs in an effective manner, coordinated manner, so that you can achieve that particular uh, goal that you have in terms of the need for energy or quality. And so uh, again, you know, the, the idea is to be able to use these two loops, if you will, uh, where you can build computational self-awareness models of the memory subsystem and then ask what are the questions at runtime to be able to make these decisions. So let's, let's set the context for why this is an interesting and also a challenging problem. And to do that, take a look at this cartoon that you see here, where uh, we're showing in this uh, x-axis, what you see here is for cache L1, uh, for different voltage le levels, uh, what kind of error you may have and what kind of approximations that you can apply. And similarly, on the y-axis, you have the same for L2. And the, uh, what you see in red is the amount of error. So you can imagine that if you uh, start cranking down your voltage, right? If you start getting very aggressive with voltage, you'll start to see errors appear in your memory subsystem. This is because you start seeing degradation in memory cell quality. And at some point you have very, very poor quality and almost nothing that you can use. And depending on the kind of technology you use, you get very different characteristics for the level of voltage that you can use for that particular platform. So that's with respect to error. You can also look at what the effect is on energy. And it's not obvious. It might, you might think, well, if I lower the voltage, you should get less energy. But actually what you see is a very, very interesting observation where uh, there's, depending on the, because of variations in manufacturing, because of the platform, they're going to be very different data points in terms of what the voltage and the energy levels are doing. But in terms of a cartoon, you can see that the pictures that you see here in terms of green, represent the energy. And so if you have, uh, you know, highly green, if you have the lowest voltage, you'd expect the best energy configuration. And uh, of course, at the lowest voltage, you'd also get maybe very high um, errors. So what's the trade-off and how do you find the design space that actually allows you to navigate this in an adaptive manner is what we can do. So in this approach, what we have done is we've been able to find that there's actually a feasible region. And within that feasible region, you're trying to identify the best design spot that would work for that particular context. Now, the obvious question is, why can't we do this statically, right? I mean, this looks like a static optimization problem. 
And the challenge is that it's very, very different because depending on the application that we use, your feasible region changes dramatically. And so the design points are going to be very sensitive to the type of application and the platform that you use. And for that reason, we need a technique that can adapt based on the kinds of applications that we use. So this, this gives you the intuition that static techniques are going to underperform. They may be too conservative. They may not be able to get the, the benefits of doing very good optimization. So having said that, we have looked at a technique that allows us to do that. I'll skip over the details here, but uh, we have actually built this uh, architecture called Scenes, where we can actually um, you know, uh, do a couple of things here. We have the ability to specify in our instruction set architecture, which parts of the application are going to be approximately. And then we can actually specify with these knobs here in terms of what our constraints and power sensors are. And we have this adaptive controller that can take all of that information and then apply these techniques in a manner that adapts based on the platform and the applications at runtime to find these feasible regions. So it's a fairly complicated um, picture. I won't have time to go through that today, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot that this idea is applicable on real platforms running real applications. Okay. And we've done some analysis that show that uh, this technique is quite adaptive and works quite well. So uh, at this point, I'll just have to say, trust me, <laughs> you can go look at the papers. Okay. <clears throat> so this was uh, a piece of work that was primarily at the architectural level, right? We looked at the memory subsystem in terms of the memory hierarchy. We tried to identify what the influence was in terms of how you can change the voltage and what expected energy might be with different applications and running different quality constraints. The next piece of work that I'd like to give you an insight on is at the system level. And here, what we want to be able to do is deploy this um, Mars middleware that we talked about. And how can we do that for systems at scale? So let's think about what do we mean by systems at scale? Many of you may be aware, but some may not be aware of that. So the first problem is that we're seeing that our platforms are getting highly heterogeneous. We know today that if you look at how resources are deployed in the cloud, we have banks of FPGAs, we have GPU, we, we have a lot of different CPUs and neural net accelerators. And the question is, as you get these workloads deployed at scale, how do you actually do resource allocation in a very effective manner, in a timely manner, that meets the quality constraint that you have. And this is a huge challenge for companies like uh, Facebook, Meta, and any of these data center owners. And one of the interesting things there is that even a couple of percent improvement can yield tremendous economic gains in terms of cost. So all those academics, we look at this and see a two or 3% improvement in energy doesn't mean anything. It turns out that that means a lot for them. So, Trying to optimize these systems, especially for the tail latency, becomes extremely important. So systems at scale have to really look at the underlooked part of what we do in a computer architecture, which is really looking at the tail latencies and how we can actually improve that. And that's where you get a lot of them. So um, I probably don't need to go through that. You know, this is just a simple example. We know that uh, today's platforms are very heterogeneous. You can have CPUs, GPUs, accelerators, uh, FPGAs. And each of these pose very different challenges for the memory subsystem. And this is highlighted in red for each of these. So for example, if you look at the CPU, uh, the unpredictable dynamism comes from resource sharing at runtime. And there's extremely high energy and latency associated with data movement at runtime. If you look at a combination of uh, CPU and GPU, like a heterogeneous platform that, that you see today, one challenge is that you may have stalls due to shared memory contention, and uh, that might limit the fairness in terms of how you can actually deliver services um, at the application level. Accelerators are getting very, very popular. I know some of you are working on different types of accelerators, right? And when you deploy them in a system and put them with the heterogeneous architecture, an important challenge is how do you orchestrate all of the memory to make sure that the right data is getting there at the right time? 
a huge challenge because your interconnection bandwidth may be limited. If you're sharing the same fat pipe, how do you ensure that you're getting the data in and out at the right level? So it's a huge challenge in a lot of these systems. So in the context of data centers, this problem becomes even more challenging because you have to do this at scale when you're running very large workloads. Um, Deep, uh, my student, Mr. Deep Mehdi, uh, spent two summers at Facebook Research, now Meta Labs, where he's been looking at trying to do this kind of optimization at scale, where he's been looking at trying to uh, improve the energy performance and cost of these applications in terms of these data center racks. So you can see here a cartoon of a rack here where you have uh, different uh, nodes at each level. And these nodes get put into a server node and then they're put into a giant rack and then you have large volumes of these racks. So not only is the thermal issue important, but how do you actually make these systems perform at scale and yield uh, quality results becomes really important. And so we've been looking at how, again, to apply these computational self-awareness principles to manage resources at the level of nodes and racks with the hope that we can scale it out. And this poses a very new challenge, systems level challenges in computer systems in how we can optimize these. Uh, we're fortunate where we actually uh, got um, one rack from Meta that we've installed in our small private data center and we're using that as an experiment. But uh, when Deep goes to Facebook in the summers, he actually has the benefit of actually doing the systems uh, research at scale. <clears throat> so what's the challenge here? Probably we all know this. When there's a football game in Cyprus, the internet is down because everyone's trying to buy tickets, right? Because the demand becomes so high or there's a popular concert. So, you know, the service providers have to deal with these abrupt changes in requirements where you may have huge volumes, short bursts of huge volumes of traffic, and at other times, maybe not much. And so how can you actually make these systems adapt very quickly and manage these surges in behavior? And those surges in behavior are surges in data volume, which means how do you manage memory resources? So again, it comes down to in the context of this talk, how we can actually apply these techniques to adapt very quickly for very different scenarios. So that's the context of how we can, again, apply these uh, self-awareness principles. We build models that then can adapt on the fly to changing resource demands. Okay, so uh, I'll skip this one, but just to give you an idea that it is a new challenge and a lot of interesting problems. So I, especially for some of, some of you that are maybe getting into the area, these are some of the new challenges that I think can become quite rewarding in terms of research. Okay. Good. All right, so let's, let's look at, um, now let's pop the stack and look at the application level. Right? We talked about architecture, we talked about full systems, now we have the applications that run on these systems. So uh, here again, we have a couple of uh, recent pieces of work that I'd like to share with you. The first is um, a, actually it's a benchmark suite that we designed for researchers to be able to deploy these end-to-end -end dynamic pipelines for adaptive autonomous systems. And it's, a, it's an approach called, uh, that the system is called Chauffeur. We published that at ES Week last year. And what it is, is it's trying to add this, this issue where in a lot of these systems, you have these computational pipelines where you can see a bunch of different sensors. Maybe you have radar, LIDAR, you have vision sensors. And then you have this computational platform here. Maybe it's a bunch of GPUs and, and almost supercomputer farms sitting in the car. And then that's producing outputs that are then activating uh, different parts of this autonomous vehicle. Real-time constraints become really important, right? Because as soon as you send something, if you have an object, you have to react to a certain time. Some of these end-to-end -end pipelines are soft real constraints. Some of them are hard real constraints. So we've seen in the real-time systems community that scheduling of real-time mixed criticality systems has become an interesting academic problem. But when you apply in, in, on real systems, it becomes a lot more challenging because you have to think of how the interplay between the memory transition 
affects the schedulability. And so we've seen in terms of how to do that in, um, in these systems. To do that, we've built this um, open source platform, which uh, has this kind of characteristic. What you see here, it's maybe a little bit small, but uh, you can see here on the left, different types of sensors that are generating data streams like camera, LIDAR, radar, cam tooling, et cetera. And that goes through a step of perception, which then maybe goes through a step of planning, and then you have actuation. And depending on the context of the platform that you're building, maybe it's a UAV, maybe it's a self-driving car, maybe it's a platoon of trucks, the context is very different. You're using different types of sensors, fusing them together, and then you're, you're merging them together. So what this, this benchmark suite allows researchers to do is to build an abstraction of the particular application use case that you have, where you can quickly put together different types of sensing, um, data streams, different types of computational engines, and actuations. And then using this technique, you can actually simulate at a high level, what your um, application's uh, memory usage might be, uh, what the computational platform might be, et cetera. So we found that it becomes very, very helpful. And uh, we have uh, done uh, some existing studies. Um, let me skip that. Well, you know, for example, we looked at um, this um, study where we deployed two simple platforms as use cases where we have a scenario where we have a camera, a LIDAR, IMU, and ultrasound generating data, which are then going through a computational pipeline and generating different types of outputs. You can see mission goals, ECU, battery status, et cetera. And then we tried applying this computational pipelines on two different platforms. The challenge that we have is that platforms are changing. So if you're trying to build a vehicle or an autonomous platform, you wanna know which platform can actually deliver the right performance and maintain safety for that particular application. So this benchmark suite allows you to actually evaluate and, and do this. And we've done some studies where uh, in this particular example, we, we did this example on two GPU platforms to see what the effects might be. And uh, we were able to see and analyze this and apply this in the context of uh, doing these policies. So, where does self-awareness fit in all of this? Right? It's just a pipeline. The point is that once you have this infrastructure in place, you can then apply these adaptive policies to see how you can make those particular end-to-end -end constraints work uh, in, in a unified manner. Okay, so I'll skip some of the challenges here, but if you're interested, I just do want to mention one important thing. Just go back for a minute. Um, the chauffeur platform actually comes with a whole set of tools. So I encourage those of you that are trying to apply this in this context, you're able to actually have um, the system specified and execute on a host platform. And it's all open source. So you can actually generate compiled binaries that can then execute on different evaluation platforms. And you have a bunch of profiling tools. So we think it's going to be a very helpful platform for researchers who are trying to do research in this area. So again, uh, you know, I have uh, uh, links to some of the details in the slides, which I'll, I'll share with you so you can take a look at these and it's all open source. So I encourage you to take a look and uh, give us feedback as well. Um, another one that uh, I wanna talk about in the context of application level is a recent piece of work that uh, actually a student is presenting at uh, Network Attached Storage Conference, NAS Conference. So, Let's take a look at this cartoon. It looks kind of busy, but what you have here is one of those end-to-end -end computational pipelines. So if you look at the top diagram, you have here a camera that's generating some data streams, and it's doing object detection, lane detection, path planning, and then it's um, actuating the steering to maybe avoid some object, right? So this is one computational pipeline. Now, what happens if during this computational pipeline, if you have a problem with memory contention, what happens if you have multiple applications running in this contention? If you don't address that in a safe manner, you could actually have, you know, in, in the best case, you may have a slowdown. In the worst case, you may have something like a fatality. So the point that I'm trying to make is that 
many subsystems can have a very insidious behavior in terms of these end-to-end -end pipelines, and you want to be able to analyze these and address them early on. And so in that context, what we've done is we have, we have tried to look at operating system policies that can proactively avoid these types of scenarios using methods of self-awareness to predict what might happen and then use proactive measures to try and eliminate those techniques. And so this is a recent piece of work that's being presented next week um, in, in the mass conference. So again, if you're interested, take a look at that. And it'll give you some insight in terms of how you can apply these techniques for end-to-end -end computational practice. Wonderful. So um, we talked a lot about computational self-awareness. We talked about these fast and slow, slow loops. We looked at multiple levels of abstraction. And I tried to give you some insight on how we applied that at the application level, at the architecture level, at the system level. And uh, you know, you might ask, so you know, where, where do we go from here? This is this is interesting, but you know, is this sustainable? Where do we go from here? So let's let's think a little bit about what we can do about that. So I think the idea again is to judiciously use self-awareness principles. It's not a hammer that you use all the time. It comes at its own cost. It might not be useful. Sometimes it's not a good idea. In fact, many times it's not a good idea to just use that. You want to think carefully about whether it makes sense to apply these techniques and when to apply them. So we have seen this in, in, in terms of, if you look at this uh, kind of uh, spider chart here, if you look at uh, looking at how we apply computational self-awareness to management, we have here, uh, this is just a cartoon that says you have approximations, introspection, self-healing, adaptation, goal orientation. You can add others. You can add security and many other dimensions. Our take is that in the past, much of the work has been fairly limited in terms of its scope. So you might see that it's tried to do some primary static and some level of early adaptivity. With computational self-awareness, we think we can expand this footprint to make these systems more adaptive. But really, what, where we want to go is to be able to get a much wider footprint across this. So I think as our research starts looking at these techniques, we hope that we can ap apply these in the context of a wider set of use cases and dimensions. So um, in terms of uh, you know, I went through, I probably ran through so many slides that your head's from spinning. So before we conclude, maybe there's some key takeaways that you should take away from this talk. If you went out the door, you say, you know, what did we really learn from here? I think the first is that we want to apply holistic runtime self-awareness principles that can apply both laterally and vertically across the stack. So if you think of the computational abstraction stack, you can apply techniques at each level and across the level. So that's very important in terms of how we do that in a unified manner. And to do that, I think we can do this using this notion of um, adaptivity using self-awareness principles. And the second is how we can apply that in these two new use cases. The first is the use case of end-to-end -end application behaviors in terms of timing, power, energy, resources, security, you name it. I think this is a hugely important application domain that's evolving and becomes even more important. And they come with a lot of interesting challenges where you can take techniques that were 10, 20, 30 years old, and they don't work anymore because the context, the assumptions are completely useless. So how do you apply them for end-to-end -end applications becomes very interesting. The second is, a probably a more difficult one for us academics. How do we actually apply these um, techniques for systems at scale? Because this requires collaboration with industry or, or places that can actually do systems at scale. And I know the Kiel Center has a lot of uh, interaction with industry, so I'm sure there's opportunities here for doing that. But in general, doing things at scale produces a lot of interesting and novel challenges that academics sometimes thought maybe is not so interesting. So I think that's something that uh, we should be starting to focus on in terms of actually improving how systems become resilient. Okay, so no good talk misses a chance to advertise, right? <laughs> so 
Um, if you're curious about self-awareness and computational self-awareness, I can point you to two recent uh, pieces of work. The first is this uh, special issue of uh, transactions on cyber-physical systems that was published in 2020. And the second is uh, we edited a special issue of self-awareness for autonomous systems in the proceedings of the IEEE. So I, I would point you to that. There's a wealth of different articles that talk about self-awareness principles in many different application domains. So take a look at those and there are many other references from there. So I'd like to end by uh, just giving you some insight on uh, other topics that we have going on in our lab. We're a highly collaborative group. We do work with many different types of uh, research outfits. Um, one uh, very productive collaboration has been with the colleagues at uh, TU Braunschweig and TU Germany in uh, this um, approach that we call as the information processing factory that you see here. And we're applying these techniques to do anomaly detection and vulnerability analysis for adaptive uh, systems of systems. But truck platooning is one example in terms of how you can make these truck platoons be safe. Truck platoon be safe. And the second uh, large uh, collection of projects is in the area of healthcare IoT, where we have a number of projects where we're taking these embedded wearables and devices and building closed loop systems where we can build models of health of individuals and provide recommendations so they can live a healthier, better life. So those are two categories of projects. So uh, I have a bunch of publications that, uh, you know, I, I talked about different topics. So uh, please feel free later on if you're curious, if you want to take a look at those. And uh, a, a number of other references as well. So uh, Theo, please uh, share them with, with, uh, with the audience and take a few minutes. So I'll, I'll stop here and I'll be happy to ask, uh, have you answer, uh, ask questions and answer questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick. That was a very, I'm looking at the picture because a few years ago, a couple of years ago, one of the, the, the group picture from the center was also from a girl. So, <laughs> uh, um, so we have a few minutes for questions. I would kindly ask since it's a lecture is really important if possible. If you have questions, please use your uh, uh, microphones located in the seats. Uh, you ready? Can, can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, yeah, thank, you. First of all, thank you for the interesting presentation. I have many, many questions and comments, but I, I will try to focus on a couple of them. The first one, um, you mentioned a lot of uh, related to voltage and memory embedded uh, end to end systems. So, if, if you want to prioritize which is the most important, is it CPU utilization? Is it, is it network traffic between components? Is it uh, voltage, as you mentioned? Which, which one should uh, suffer? I mean, if, if you have to focus on all of them, it's, it's going to be a complex interaction between all these uh, performance. Uh, so if you could comment on that. Absolutely. Thank you for that. It's, it's a, actually a great question and something we, we deal with and grapple with almost every day. And, and the short answer is we are doing use-inspired research. So I think depending on the context of the use case, these um, techniques naturally fall out. So if you're looking at, for example, a computational pipeline for end-to-end -end, and you're applying that on a heterogeneous platform with GPUs and CPUs, then maybe you're looking at the network traffic because that's where it's most important. If you have just one uniform resource, then maybe you're looking at maybe voltage frequency scaling as one option. So I think it's very much use case inspired based on the kind of use case and the platforms at hand. And we, look, we study very carefully based on that particular use case, try to focus on the specific knobs and the actuations. And that's really, I think, what you're asking because there's just too many combinations. It's a huge explosion. So I, I think um, maybe that's a very a good question that you brought up and uh, something that, that requires a great deal of attention to focus very much on trying to under, understand the context of use, both from the application and the platform, and then identify where are the pain points and then use that as the mechanism. So the, there is no answer. And, and I, I think a large part of this research is trying to understand how we can build these models for this particular use case. Now, having said that, 
you know, in a data center, for example, it could be a lot more complicated. But for that reason, they tend to silo their application workloads. And again, they're also use case based because they know that some, some things are more streaming based, some are going to be more, more event based and they silo them. So then again, we can use those techniques to understand what the memory characteristics are and where the pain points. Are. So hopefully that kind of, you know, I didn't answer the question per se, but told you the strategy we would use to try and disentangle this complex explosion of, uh, you know, cross constraints. <clears throat> And my second uh, take comment is uh, you mentioned that the other day, one of your most, most more recent works is on how to prioritize tasks at the uh, of, 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 uh, um, operating system level. Um, but I, I, I would think of uh, especially real time uh, online systems, uh, again, end system, you wouldn't be using. Uh, Systems per se with schedules and so on, but can so right. why, why why would you need to use an operating system? In right, this kind that's that's an excellent question. So the, the classical view has been so just to pop the stack. It's a great question again. Um, if you look at how real time systems have evolved, right? So the community has focused on you know the fact that general purpose operating systems are not predictable, too heavyweight. So why don't you build kernels that are really defined for that particular app? On the other hand, if you look at deployment of today's large scale autonomous vehicles, they have to coexist and be adaptable because you want to be able to add new applications. So industry at large is moving towards aggregation to larger scale platforms with more uniform operating systems. So there, what we want to be able to do is find ways where we can actually have mechanisms to coexist between real time performance together with general purpose applications. So there you might actually take even general purpose kernels like Linux and then have small kernels built in with some level of isolation where you can actually get real time performance. And so that's where we think there is gonna be again some application. If you're doing this in the context of a, a completely self-contained um, embedded system, I think that's not an issue. But I think at scale, this does become an issue and something that we have to address. <laughs> I mean, uh, probably you mean we could have a longer discussion on this. It's it's a huge problem. I mean, uh, you you could use different levels of virtualization. So I think that the, the whole space is quite open in terms of what strategy and architect, software architecture should we use? Should the base architecture be bare metal? Should it be based on uh, some more uniform architecture? And again, depends on the use case. So if, if it looks like the standard platform requires the deployment of some more heavyweight operating system kernel, then you want to understand how to coexist. If the use case is I'm building a drone, I, you know, I don't need to worry about everything, I'll customize it. So I think I think there's going to be a wide range of implementations, and we have to adapt based on the strategy we use. But that's a great question. Thank, Thank you. So thank you for the wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions, but uh, I'll start by a follow up on Alvanayev's first question. So um, uh, indeed, the, the functional parameters that we want to optimize at these levels, such as performance, efficiency, and all that, it's, it's, it's very tough to um, co-optimize all of this together. So I fully um, understand the very high of uh, being driven by the use case. Uh, if I may add to that, then I, I, I ask for your comment, what about non-functional parameters such as, let's say, security or uh, reliability at the hardware or the software level? So um, those, again, that of course, they can be use case driven, but do you think that there is a uh, a bare minimum, which any type of uh, uh, application nowadays uh, should satisfy with regards to those parameters. 
I think the, you know you brought up some two very challenging problems. So let me address the reliability issue because that that I think is somewhat resilience and reliability. That in some sense, in my mind, is perhaps a little more containable for the reason that we can actually define what we mean by the uh, kind of uh, the errors, the models for what happens, and then try and build models and based on that, react to that. So I think that's probably, we, we have done some of that work, but not extensively. We've done that because I was part of a group that had done the variability expedition looking at how we can expose manufacturing variability up the stack and how we might deploy techniques. So some of the work in adapt adaptivity came from that space. Um, security, on the other hand, as we all know, it's, it's really very hard to define what they mean by that. So I think that is an open challenge, an open problem. Uh, we have not addressed much in that space at, as yet. We have started collaborating with some of our research in that space. But I, I, my personal take is that it's going to be a lot more challenging. Because you know, and there's always this aspect of the cat and mouse problem. That, that you define some secure attack, you break it and so on, but you'll never have the comfort of really understanding is this system really secure? Because you might act, actually argue that all systems are inherently insecure. And so you have to live with the insecurity, which is a different model than we do in engineering. Where we have kind of a well-defined space and we do that. So that, I, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for that. I think I, that, that's a very, very open challenge. I mean, sure, we can publish papers on, on that, but. In, in terms of actually solving the problem, I think that that's a lot more difficult, is, is my take. So. Yeah, because I was actually thinking this, um, this, this high level uh, concept that you propose for cross layer um, uh, sensing and uh, reflecting and then making decisions. Um, uh, to my mind, it's a little bit more clear if you want to address the reliability, how we can do that. Uh, at the different uh, layers. Uh, one point that you mentioned about fusing the data, uh, maybe we can have a discussion later on about on how we could do this because it's interesting to see if you can reflect from one abstraction layer and make decisions for what's happening in a different abstraction layer. But for security, it's not clear to me uh, if, if this approach. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. I, I agree. I think I think it's a huge challenge and it's it's an open issue. Yeah. And, and the final question here, I'm thinking, uh, just more detailed, a uh, more detailed question. Well, there, um, your solution for the architectural layer, you mentioned, of course, the need for going with dynamic approaches because it's workload dependent. Um, do you have any insights on what type of um, characteristics of the workload? Um, uh, make the difference? Is it between um, memory intensive and computationally intensive workloads, or are there any other characteristics? So, um, again, we can have a long conversation of that offline, but uh, you know. Uh, our study was that, uh, you know, we, we know uh, in, in the architect and application domain, there's been uh, quite a bit of work in understanding, um, you know, phasic behavior of applications, right? So this is something that people have exploited for many years, looking at workloads and trying to exploit from the patterns of how things work and so on. But those have primarily been looking at computational phasic behaviors, trying to see when the computation goes up. One of the studies that we did looked at the memory phasic behavior. And it turns out that the memory phasic behavior is not always aligned with computational behavior for a very simple reason, because memory requires communication. And so although you might think if I analyze a program and there's a big loop inside, so it's going to be data intensive, so there's computation, there's memory, right? But it turns out that the, they, they don't overlap completely. So my point is that I think there's an opportunity to understand not just computation, but computation, memory, and throughput, communication, and understand sort of those dimensions of, if you want uh, patterns of phasic behaviors, and then use that as a starting point to optimize. I think that's where we, I think we can actually apply some more principled approaches to applying how we can adapt. And then, and then you can take the use case and so on. I think you're really asking, is there some method to the madness rather than just, you know, use case? Yes, there is, but I think it's, it really requires us to understand how we can extract those dimensions of 
uh, behavior patterns, and then use that to build models on which we can do predictions and analysis. So I think that's a starting point. <clears throat> great questions, by the way. I love this audience. This is great. I forgot that we have a lot of online participants to ask if the if there's any question from the online audience. I mean, used to this online hybrid. Uh, <laughs> so I apologize if I there was anyone that missed it. But I don't we have any hands. Okay. So in the interest of time, uh, thank you very much, Nick. Let's thank Nick for the lecture today. <laughs> um, if there are any Further questions you can ask uh, Nick uh, offline that we don't uh, take time. Uh, thank you, everybody. Please make sure you are signed up uh, the sign up sheet in case you didn't do it before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.